experience with them. I let my wife kill those. <laughs> and she does. She's not afraid of, well, she's not afraid of anything that I ever heard of. But she's certainly not afraid of snakes. She was born and reared in China uh, in a town that she said she never went to sleep a single night that she didn't hear gunshots. And so she learned not to be afraid because she's never saw fear in her father and mother because the town would change hands every once in a while as bandits or warlords would come in and then finally the Japanese came and my father-in-law had a big hospital and he lived through all that and she was there 17 years. But I want to say that today as I walked out on that little place, I began to think and meditate a little bit and I watched a bird. I don't know the name of that bird. It's a big bird and it has different colors. It may be a magpie, I'm not sure, but it certainly has a strange sound to North Carolina ears. And then the bird sat on a fence post and he sat there by himself. No mate came around. Now we have a lot of doves where I live and as you know, they mate for life and they would go around together and they have friendship and fellowship and uh, produce little children, little birds. <laughs> and, uh, but this bird today seemed to be all alone. And I thought about this passage of scripture that's found in the 101st of 102nd Psalm. I'm like a pelican in the wilderness. I'm like an owl in the desert. I watch in him as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. You know, tonight, there are many lonely people here, many single people in the city of Denver. 51% of your population is single. And many of those people are lonely. And one of the supreme problems of modern society is loneliness. The modern city is a lonely place. Here in America, 70% more people are living alone in one-person dwellings than 10 years ago. A New York psychiatrist was quoted the other day as saying, New York City is the loneliest place in the world for millions. What would you say about Denver or the town you come from? An American university study reported that university students are the loneliest people in the United States followed by divorced people. Are you lonely? One of the principal causes of loneliness is alcoholism and drug use. Alcohol and drugs are efforts to escape loneliness. Drugs take you on a trip and being drunk makes you feel that you've got somebody with you. On the other hand, going with Christ is a trip in which you really always have Jesus with you as your Lord and companion. You cannot drink your way out of loneliness. Most young people turn to drugs for kicks and get hooked or peer pressure but thousands turn to drugs because of loneliness. A magazine cover story recently had a neglected youth. It said that actually most of them are properly clothed and fed, but something is missing in the lives of millions. It's a neglect of the spirit, the article said, which leaves them lonely and prone to drugs and alcohol, but all too often leads to suicide. What can be done about it? One of the key words in the Bible is communion, from which we get our word communication. Jesus came to a man one time that was lonely and sick and paralyzed. 38 years he'd sat in the same spot, lonely and tired without a friend. And Jesus looked at him and said, do you need a friend? And he said, yes. This bundle of loneliness and human pain had been buffeted by the surging tides of thousands of people. But Jesus singled him out. He became his friend that day and he healed him. He can become your friend tonight if you'll let him. Loneliness began actually in the Garden of Eden, in a perfect paradise, when man and woman declared their independence of God. They said, we don't need you, God. We can build this world without you. So they made a terrible choice. They chose to turn away from God. They went their own way, tried to build their world, and sin entered at that beautiful garden. 
and it was given to the next generation, the next generation, the next, the next, down to you and me. And we all have the disease, and it's a fatal disease. Nobody ever escapes the judgment of the disease of sin. So you, the roots of loneliness were planted in the human soul and we, has been inherited by every inhabitant ever. Because you see, in that garden, God went looking for Adam. He knew where he was, but he went looking for him. He wanted Adam to know where he was. He said, Adam, where are you? And Adam tried to hide, got some fig leaves and sewed them on. He didn't know he was naked till then. But he couldn't hide. Loneliness has never been a respect of persons. The world's greatest artists, writers and composers, kings and queens and carpenters and plumbers and everybody have felt this terrible thing called loneliness. In John 13, it tells about the Last Supper and it tells about the betrayal of Judas and the scripture says he went out and it was night. No one ever went away from Jesus but what it was night. Perhaps there was a time that you knew the fellowship of God's people and you had peace with God, but you've backslidden, you've gone away, you've turned away, you've fallen aside. There was a time when you knew Christ, you felt you knew him. There was a time when you felt you meant business with God, but now your heart has grown cold and hard towards spiritual things. You've been pulled away by others and other things and other gods and other pleasures that you know to be wrong. And you went out from the presence of God and you have found that it's night out there. You don't have fellowship with true believers and you don't feel really at home in the world you're living in. And certainly you no longer have fellowship with Christ. And there's no loneliness quite so bitter as the loneliness of a backslidden Christian who claims with his mouth that he knows Christ, but deep in his heart he knows he doesn't. How many of you are straddling the fence trying to put one foot in God's kingdom and one foot in the world's kingdom? Sin makes us lonely because it separates us from God. And it was never in God's intention for you to be lonely. Hundreds of surveys prove that our society has not made us a better adjusted or happier society. Oh yes, we can have fleeting moments of sensual satisfaction, create a bitterness and a loss of sense of pleasure that no psychiatrist can cure. The Bible says that the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest whose water cast up mire and dirt. Remember the story of Jesus with the woman on the, at the well? She was a lonely woman. She had several husbands, had had several husbands, no satisfaction, no peace, no joy. Jesus came and talked to her, forgave her her sins, transformed her life, made her a new person. She went into the village of Sychar and told all the people that here was someone that knows all about you. Come and see him. And they all went out to see Jesus. The Bible says he's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Even though great crowds surrounded him, at times he was alone. Even at the end, the scripture says, all the disciples forsook him and fled. The crowds who shouted one day, Hosanna. That same week, five days later, they were crucifying him. And at last we hear from the cross, Jesus on the cross dying for you and for me. God laying on him all of our sins and our judgment and our hell, which he took on that cross. He says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In that terrible moment, something mysterious happened. No theologian can explain it. Jesus took your sins, your judgment, your hell. All the penalty that I deserve for my sins, he took on that cross. And it was a lonely moment, a lonely period. 
when he alone had to bear the cross and he became guilty of all the sins of the whole world. He experienced ultimate loneliness as he died for you and died for me. I've never understood how a person can turn away from Jesus when they actually see him on that cross. Dying for you and to reject him, to turn away when he offers you forgiveness, he offers you a new life, he offers you peace and joy and friendship, never to be lonely again. Through his death, Christ dealt with the primary cause of human loneliness, separation from God. Because hell essentially is separation from God. Hell is the loneliest place in the universe. Jesus suffered its agonies for you. Jesus was lonely for you. I remember when my grandmother died, I had the privilege of being there at that time. She sat up in bed with a smile and a glow on her face. Her husband had been wounded at Gettysburg, lost an eye, lost a leg at Gettysburg. And she sat up and she said, I see Ben, her husband, who had died some years earlier. And she said, oh, the music is so beautiful. And then she fell back on the pillow out in eternity. I remember when my mother was dying a relatively short time ago and all the wonderful sayings that she left behind on her deathbed because she just lived only for the Lord. She had a joy and a peace. You never went into her room that you didn't come out and feel that she was ministering to you. You didn't minister to her. And even when she was in a coma, she woke up one night and quoted scripture. And the nurse said she never saw such a look on anybody's face. And fell back into her coma and went into eternity. There's a great difference even in the last hour between those who know Christ and those who don't know him. Then there's the loneliness of your decision. Because you see, Christ died for you. He rose again. He's living. He wants to come into your heart. He offers you forgiveness and salvation and assurance and peace and joy. And he offers you a tough life. I'm not going to play games with you and tell you that it's easy to follow Christ. It's not. He said, if you're not willing to deny self and take up a cross and follow me, you can't, follow, you can't be my disciple. Now, the cross was a place where they executed criminals. It would be like today, he said, take up the electric chair and follow me. He said, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. And he said, if you follow me, he said, you're going to have troubles and difficulties and problems and persecution and maybe death. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to go all the way with me to the cross? Oh yes, in the midst of it, there'll be his peace and his joy and his friendship and his forgiveness and his promise and the hope that he offers for the future. But there will also be the possibility of persecution and suffering and problems that you never dreamed of when you come to Christ. We've been in those parts of the world where people suffer because they come to Christ. You must make the decision about Christ yourself. Our reaction to loneliness is often to deal with the symptoms rather than the cause. We get involved in pleasures, parties, good times, sex. We get involved in our work. We throw ourselves into the social world at the school. We read one of the best-selling books which urges us to take control of our lives. Any attempt to deal with sin without conversion is like struggling in quicksand. And how many young people today and older people are struggling in quicksand, trying to save yourself, but you can't. You've come to the end of your rope. Turn your life over to Christ. Let him bear your burdens. Help you solve your problems. Help direct and lead you 
in your life. How many young people here tonight do not really know what you want to do with your life? Or help you in your marriage? Who you ought to marry? There's a lady talk to me tonight who said she's just waiting for the right man to come along. And there are many like that. Be sure it's God's man, a God's woman. I remember I took my three daughters aside when they were, oh, they couldn't have been more than eight, nine, or 10 years of age. And I said, let's stop here in the mountain and pray for your husbands who you're going to marry, their boys somewhere, and let's just pray that God will lead them and lead you and that they will be men of God. Well, they looked at me as though their dad had gone crazy. But we prayed, and they got the right men too. One of them's here tonight. And we prayed the same way for our sons. Both For the first time in many, several years at least, both of my sons are here tonight. I don't know where they are, but they're here somewhere. But you have to make this decision alone. If we search for an antidote to loneliness and drugs and alcohol and sex and encounter groups and psychological experiences, often it only serves to mire us deeper in despair without a remedy. Through Jesus Christ, we can have the most fundamental relationship in life restored. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. The psalmist that wrote that about the pelican and the owl said, Oh, my soul, why be so gloomy and discouraged? Trust in God. I shall again praise him for his wondrous help. He will make me smile again, for he is my God. Loneliness is often God's way of letting us know it is time to reach out, reach out to the cross, and you'll never be lonely again. A couple of weeks ago, I received a letter which said, quote, about a month ago, my wife and I separated. She moved out of our house saying that she could not stand to be around me anymore. We'd gotten to a point where we could not communicate with each other anymore. We were throwing accusations, some founded and some not, and bitter, spiteful words at each other. So she moved out and went to live with another man until she could get an apartment of her own. On June the 8th this year, I had come home from work, and after dinner I felt a compulsion to turn on the tube. I attribute it to the loneliness and frustration I was feeling. Sometimes the tube can be an excellent fire escape for a short while but it's not a good fire extinguisher, he said. Anyway, I turned the set on and randomly flipped the dial. The station I had chosen was just announcing the beginning of the Billy Graham crusade from South Carolina. I don't mind telling you, I was more than a little skeptical about televised religious programs, but I continued to watch. At the end of your sermon, which I felt was directed at me and my situation, when you called those people who wanted to change the direction of their lives to come forward and receive Christ as their Savior, I hesitated, but then I did. At this time, my wife and I are starting to put things back on track. Another one. Last night, I preached on John 3:16, and the people here said it all together for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life and last night more than 1700 people came and made their commitment to christ a few weeks ago no no a few weeks ago in one of our crusades a man looked at that same verse and the counselor told him you can put your name in that verse. You are the whosoever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, put your name there. Whosoever, believe it, or commit his life to him, will never perish but have everlasting life. And then he had a grin on his face and he said, I like that. 
You can put your name tonight in that same way as all of those did last night. God so loved the world for you that he gave his son. And you put your name and say, Lord, I open my heart and my life to you. I commit myself to you. For some of you, it may be that you're going to recommit your life. For others, you're going to make a brand new start. You want to be sure how you stand before God tonight. I'm going to ask you to do what we saw those people do last night. We've seen people in every continent of the world do. And more than three score countries, we've seen people do what I'm asking you to do. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat, hundreds of you, and say tonight, I want to serve Christ. I want to follow Christ. I want to receive Christ. I want to come to the cross. I want to put my confidence and my trust in Him. I want my sins forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want to be sure that Christ lives in my heart. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you. You say, well, Billy, why do you ask people to come forward publicly? Because Jesus, every person Jesus called, he called publicly. And he said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. There's something about coming forward publicly and taking a stand in public that makes it count. I'm going to ask you, if you come from that gallery up on top, it's going to take you two or three minutes, so start now. And I'm going to ask that no one leave the stadium, please. This is the holy moment. And God is speaking to you wherever you are. And if you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. If you've come in a bus, they'll wait on you. And after you've all come, I'll say a word to you, have a prayer with you, give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. Or you can bring your friend with you. But just get up and come quickly, hundreds of you. Back over here, over there, upstairs. You may be in the choir and God has spoken to you even though you're in the choir. You may be a Sunday school teacher. You may be a leader in your church, but God has spoken to you about your need of Christ. You get up and come. Over here on the ends, everywhere, quickly. Parts of the country that have been watching by television, you can make this same commitment tonight. And whether you're in, at home, or in a bar, or in a hotel room, you can have that knowledge that your sins are forgiven, that you're justified. And the word justified means just as though you had never sinned in your life. That's how God looks at you through the blood of Christ. He will come into your heart where you are. And if you'll make that commitment, pick up the telephone and call that number that you see on your screen. May God help you to make that commitment that so many hundreds here in Colorado I'm making on this beautiful Colorado evening. God bless you. And this reminder again, as Mr. Graham has just told you, we'd like to talk with you and pray with you, so make that telephone call now. The number is there on your screen. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I'll just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Pilate asked the question, what is truth? And truth, not facts, are what we're talking about tonight. And there's a difference. Facts are not necessarily the truth.
They're the best we know at the time. But today's newspapers, I mean this day's newspapers, reported that public confidence in the leadership of our major institutions, such as the media, education, banking, government, the military, medicine, business, has sunk to the lowest in at least a decade. And every institution today is under attack in our country. The home, the church, the government. And many people are asking, what is the truth? They're asking, what is the truth about the airliner that was downed off the coast of Japan? And inside the pages of the Bible are stories of lust and hate and war and crime as bad as anything that we read in history. It's called the Holy Bible. It's holy because it tells the truth. It tells the truth about God, about man, about the devil. But Satan has caused a credibility gap to be established. Our magazines are filled with stories of Satan worship. Satan has his disciples, demons, sorcery, witchcraft, and wizards are front page news today. And the devil and his legions seem to be gathering steam for the last great conquest of this earth. Now, Jesus wasn't afraid to call him what he was. Jesus called him a liar and the father of lies. He said, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. In the Garden of Eden, God had said, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. If you eat of that particular tree, all the fruit in the garden is yours, except that one tree. God was testing man. The devil came along. He was in the garden. How did the devil get here? Read the 14th chapter of Isaiah, the 28th chapter of Ezekiel, and you'll get some hints and ideas as to how Satan came to this planet. He was probably the finest and the most gorgeous of all the created beings of God. And one day his heart was lifted with pride, and he decided he wanted to be greater than God. So he led a rebellion against God. Now, we don't know how that happened. That's a mystery beyond our comprehension. There's no use really spending any time on it because we just don't know. But, he, but we do know what he said to Eve. He said, yea, hath God said? He was putting doubt in her mind about the word of God. Just as the devil is still putting doubts concerning the inspiration of scriptures. Are the scriptures authoritative? Are they infallible? Yea, hath God said? And then ye shall not die. That was the next thing she said, universalism. Everybody will be saved eventually. And then you will be as God. That's what the secularist and the humanist are saying. We're our own God. Now, the first time that man had to make a choice between God's truth and the devil's lie, he chose the devil's lie. And when Adam and Eve rejected God's truth and accepted the devil's lie, that was the moment that all the troubles of the whole world began. Our sinful nation, nature, often sides with the devil's lie instead of God's truth. Because, you see, we are now sinners. We're crippled, crippled for life. And we side with the lie. We'd rather believe the devil's lie than God's truth. And a child can lie before it can talk. It can steal before it can walk. Ask your child before he can talk or walk, did you take your sister's doll? And he, being unable to talk, shakes his head no. He lied before he could talk. And he stole before he could walk. Now, where did he learn to lie? The disease is inherited like other inherited diseases. You see, we inherit it from our parents, and they inherited it, inherited it from their parents, on back to Adam and Eve. It's a disease that is all through the whole human race. No group of people in the world are exempted from the disease of sin. And it's the disease of sin that is at the heart of the troubles of the world at this moment. Sin is taking sides with the lie. Now, the Bible speaking of the Antichrist says in 2 Thessalonians 2, this lawless man is produced by the spirit of evil and armed with all the force, wonders and signs and falsehood can devise. 
to those involved in this dying world, he will come with evil's undiluted power to deceive, for they have refused the love of truth, which could have saved them. God sends upon them, therefore, the full force of evil's delusion, so that they put their faith in an utter fraud and meet the inevitable judgment of all who have refused to believe the truth and who have made evil their playfellow. And God also says in Romans 1, these men deliberately forfeited the truth of God and accepted a lie. God, therefore, handed them over to disgraceful passions. They see truth as a lie, and a lie is the truth. And they make money, power, sex experience, and other things their gold and their gods. And they accept the lies of the devil. And many young people that are here tonight are accepting now the whispers of Satan in your ear. Come down this path. Take this drug. Sleep with this girl. Do this, do that. And you'll find pleasure and happiness. That's the way you ought to live. And then there's religious hypocrisy that brings no lasting peace. Millions of young people go to church without having a personal relationship with Christ. I remember I used to be taken to church by my parents, and I hated church. They made me go to church, and I had to sit there, and my cousins and I sometimes could slip away and crawl under the seats, or we could make little paper airplanes and fling them, and my father would always see it, and he would say, I'll see you when we get home, and he never forgot, never forgot. And I got a many a whipping because of what I did in church. And I couldn't wait to grow up and go away from home so I wouldn't have to go to church. But then when I was about 16 or 17, I received Christ as my Savior. And I went back to church, and the next Sunday I told my parents, I said, you know, Dr. Lindsay certainly is preaching a wonderful sermon. He's learned something from this evangelistic campaign in our city. And they said, no, he's preaching the same type of sermons, but you're just listening with different ears. And I was. And I began to make notes on the sermons I was hearing. Come to Christ. It's so easy to be in the church. Well, they even elected me the president of the young people's class, and they elected me the treasurer even. And uh, I was uh, looked upon as a good person. And they didn't know that I was rejecting Christ all the time and rejecting the teachings of the church and couldn't wait to get away. I was a hypocrite. Now there's another delusion that's going around among young people, and that is that peace is just around the corner. It is not. There will not be any peace in the world until the Prince of Peace is taken into account and the Prince of Peace comes. But we find deception, delusion, and the practicing of the lie on every hand. The credibility gap is seen everywhere. What is the answer? What can young people do? Turn to Christ. Turn to the truth. He said, my truth will set you free from the bondage and shackles of sin. And you that are watching by television, Pick up the phone and call that number that's on the screen right now. Their counsel is standing by. They'll be happy to talk to you. And if you first you call and it's busy, call again. Call several times. They'll be there all evening to help you in your Christian life or to find Christ right now. There are many of you with problems in the home or problems with drugs or alcohol or whatever. Call and talk to that counselor now. Jesus said ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. He is the truth. He said, I am the truth. I'm the embodiment of all truth. It's in me. You come to Jesus Christ and he's the truth. He's not the lie. And he tells the truth. Jesus did not say, ye shall know a truth or any truth, but the truth. There are usually truths in every religion and every philosophy. But he's the embodiment of all truth. The scripture says about Jesus Christ that he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist, that in all things he might have the preeminence 
for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. That is the truth I'm asking you to receive and believe tonight instead of the devil's lies. Jesus said, if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. If you don't believe that and don't accept that and know Christ, you're going to die in your sins and you'll be lost. Jesus Christ claimed to be ultimate truth. Are you willing to face the truth? Jesus Christ told the truth about everything. He told the truth about sin. He said, for within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts and adulteries and all the other sins that we commit. It's out of the heart. War comes from the human heart. Family tensions and problems come from the human heart. Rebellion comes from the human heart. We are that way by nature. He told the truth about love. He said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves you. You say, Billy, how, do you, how could God love me? You don't know what I've done. You don't know what a big hypocrite I've been. I don't have to know. I just know that whatever you've done, whatever you are now, God loves you. And he loves you with a love that you don't even know anything about because there is no human love comparable to divine love. God's love sent his son to the cross to die and shed his blood for you. And he would have died had you been the only person in the whole world. He loves you. Don't ever forget he loves, 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 loves you. And he sees you sitting there. And when he was on the cross because he was God, he had the capacity to look down these 20 centuries and see you and say, for you, Jim, I'm hanging on this cross and there is being put on me right now your sins. You've told lies, Jim, or Mary, or Susie, or whatever your name is. You've committed immorality. You've stolen. You've been a big hypocrite. You've listened to the devil. You've done all those things. Well, let me tell you, Jim, Mary, Susie, your sins right now are being put on me. I'm dying for you. I'm taking your judgment and your hell on me now. And I'm going to stay on this cross. I could come down and you could go to hell. But I love you too much. I'm going to stay here and die for you. And that's exactly what our Lord Jesus Christ did. And God raised him from the dead and he's alive. And so I do not preach to you a dead Christ hanging on a cross. I preach to you a risen Christ who's alive tonight and who is coming back. Yes, God so loved. And then he told the truth about judgment. Jesus warned people to flee the wrath of God. Yes, God is angry with the wicked every day. God has anger and that anger is going to explode into the judgment. Jesus said, every idle word that men speak, they shall give account in the day of judgment. Every idle word, all your thoughts, all your words, everything you've ever done will be at the judgment and you will be condemned by your own words. He said, except you repent, you shall perish. Now that's truth. Unless you repent, unless you, Mary, Bill, Susie, unless you repent, you're going to perish. What is repentance? Have you repented? Are you sure of it? I was a good boy in church. I never repented. I might have said something to the elders when they uh, met with me to see if I was okay to join the church at 12. I didn't know what they were even talking about. I'd memorized the catechism. I couldn't understand it. It was just some memory things for me. I hadn't really repented because repentance means that I change. I change my mind about God, about myself, about my fellow man. I change my way of living. But you know, I don't have any strength to change. I can't really change. I can't really become a Christian. Why? Because I'm dead in trespasses and in sins. God has to help me change. He has to help me repent. And I say, oh God, help me to repent. And then the second thing, not only do you have to repent, but by faith you must receive Christ into your heart as Savior and Lord. 
And Jesus told the truth about conversion. He said, he indicated you cannot be born into the Christian faith. You have to be born from above, born again. And the process is called conversion, which includes faith. And Jesus said, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, he's not telling the ad he's not telling people to become like adults. He's telling us to become like little children and have childlike faith. Some people try to enter the kingdom of God head first. They want to understand it. But you can never understand it all. There are many things in the Bible I don't understand. You come by simple faith like a little child trusts its mother and its father. And you put your total confidence in Jesus Christ by faith. Have you done that? Repent, receive by faith, and then obey him, live the life, follow him, serve him, whatever the cost. And it's costly. Let's face it, in the world in which we live, if you hold on to Christian values and you live up to moral standards laid down by Christ, it's going to cost you. It'll cost you some friends. It'll cost you some money. It'll cost you a lot of things and certain pleasures of the world. It'll cost us. And sometimes I have a hard time deciding on some things. Whether I should have this or have that, whether I should go there or go here. Because we lived in a confused world. Satan has confused us. And no longer do we even hear many sermons on being separated from the world. What does it mean to be separated from the world? The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things of the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The world and the lust thereof shall pass away, but he that doeth the will of God shall abide forever. I remember preaching sermons on that and hearing sermons on that years ago. Separated from the sins of the world, having our own lifestyle, having our own Christian culture. Where is it? We somehow think we can hold hands with the world and make it to heaven. We somehow think we can have our one foot in the world and one foot in heaven and we're going to make it. We won't. So there's repentance, there's faith, and there's obedience. Following Christ, even to the death. He said, even to the death of the cross. Are you willing to do that? Ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Every day, newspapers, radio, and television tell us of demonstrations and marches and protests and bombings, all of which are designed to gain some sort of freedom. A little baby, for example, may scream and cry and wave its arms and legs trying to be free, but without restraint and care, it would soon be dead. I read about a baby. I think it was locked in a car. I don't know if it was here in Sacramento. It was here in California in all this heat. And the mother went into the store, and she was only gone a few minutes, and she came back, and the little baby had suffocated. Baby needs care. A teenager rejects his parents in search of freedom and soon finds himself dependent on some drug or on some gang. Thousands of laws indicate that we do not have total freedom. Jesus said he would give you total freedom, spiritual and moral freedom, and ultimately freedom from the very presence of sin when we get to heaven. Pope John Paul gave a message last week in Austria on the prodigal son. And we have just made a, a motion picture, by the way, on the prodigal that's being released just about now throughout the country. And I hope you'll see it. It's the best picture we've ever made. We've been making them for 30 years. But the history of mankind, he said, is the history of the misuse of freedom. The history of mankind is the misuse of freedom. Jesus will teach us how to use our freedoms for the glory of God and will bring fulfillment in our lives. Before you come to Christ, you're a slave of sin. No other truth can free you. Scientific truth can't free you. Mathematical truth or philosophical truth will not free you. Suicide will not free you. That only kills the body. It doesn't kill the spirit of the soul. Zacchaeus was freed by Christ from greed and Mary Magdalene from lust and Peter 
was freed from his cowardice. Christ's truth makes you free, free from the penalty of sin. You'll never have to go to hell. You'll never face the judgment. Freedom someday from the presence of sin. Freedom from the power of sin now. Sin shall no longer have dominion over you from right now on if you come to Christ. Right now, the devil snaps the whip. You obey. You're his slave. You don't think you are, but you are. You can be free right now by coming to Christ and letting him change you. I'm going to ask you tonight to do something we have already seen hundreds of people do in this crusade. And we've seen thousands on every continent. Oriental people, black people in Africa, Europeans, Latin American people in every country in Latin America except Bolivia where we've held crusades, we've seen them do this same thing. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of the platform as a symbol, a symbolic act, in which you're saying, I do repent the best I know how with God's help. I do receive him. I will follow him and obey him. Or maybe you're coming because you would like to be sure we had a bishop come forward one night in a city not too long ago, and he said, I came forward because I wanted to make sure of my relationship with Christ. You may be a leader in the church, but you're not sure that your sin is forgiven, that you're going to heaven, or that you are free, the kind of freedom that Christ is talking about. He's the truth that can set you free. And after you've all come and stood here, we're going to have a prayer and I'm going to say a word to you and then give you some literature and you can go back to your friends. If you're with friends and relatives, they'll wait on you. If you come from that top stand up there, it'll take you almost two minutes, so start now. Hundreds of you come from everywhere, from the back, from the front. And after you've come, we'll have our prayer, give you your literature, and you can go back and join your friends. But get up and come. If there's a doubt in your heart tonight that you're ready to meet God, you come. And make sure that your sins are forgiven that you're going to heaven. Quickly, get up and come right now. We're going to wait on you. Hundreds of people are responding here tonight. You can call the number on your screen where people are standing by ready to talk to you to help you with your spiritual needs and problems. Write the number down. If the line is busy, wait a few moments and call again. You that have been watching by television, there's a telephone number there that you can call and find help by talking to a counselor that's standing by waiting to talk to you about some of these things that I've talked about tonight, about your relationship to Christ. Make that call, and if it's busy, keep trying. May God help you to make that commitment tonight, and may God bless you, and be sure, and go to church next Sunday.
If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. And lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, in this university of life, you can fail, but you cannot drop out. And unto me, Jesus said, come unto me. That's the first invitation that he ever gave was in this passage. All ye that labor, that word labor means a toiler, a person that cannot find rest, and a heavy laden. They were laden down with the ceremonies of the law the ceremonial law and the moral law of the Old Testament. All the rules that the Pharisees and the religious leaders had laid down, all the legalistic things, and they were laden down with it. They were laboring with it. Jesus said, come unto me and I'll give you rest. The rest of refreshment, not the rest of doing nothing. And this invitation is to men and women who have exhausted with this search for truth. You've become exhausted searching for the purpose and the meaning of life. Where did I come from? Why am I here and where am I going? I'm searching for a purpose and a meaning to my life. I'm searching for truth and you're exhausted from it. Jesus is claiming that the weary search for God ends with himself. He said, now you've found the truth. I am the truth. You can stop your searching. You've found it. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I'm meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus said, come to me, all ye that are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Wouldn't you like to have the relaxation and the rest that Jesus can give you? There's some of you watching by television that would like that. There's a number on your screen. You can pick up a phone and call right now and talk to a person who is trained to answer your questions and help you. Because you can have this relaxation and peace and forgiveness and joy that Christ can bring into your life. Pick up the phone now and call. But there are many people that want to escape from life. And they say with the psalmist, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then would I fly away and get out of the world. Have you ever wanted to do that? Just get out of the mess you're in. Get away from the pressures of life and fly away. Well, you can't. The psalmist longing to escape has become the cry of so many in our world today. The Bible is right up to date. It is the book of life for man and it's never changed. The psalmist also said, I'm full of heaviness and I look for some to take pity but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. And you've looked everywhere for help, and you haven't been able to find it. And I think that the, the period between about 14 and 25 is the toughest period in all of life because your body is changing. You're changing psychologically and physiologically, and yet you're asked to make some of the greatest decisions of your entire life. Where are you going to go to school? What kind of job do you want? Or if you can even get a job. What is going to be your vocation? Who you're going to marry? And you're asked to make those lifetime decisions. What is going to be your philosophy in life? Who's going to guide you and direct you? What's going to be your religion? Because all of us are religious by nature. We believe that there's a God I don't believe there are any atheists in this audience tonight. To those who feel there's no way out of their problem, Jesus said, I am the way out. Jesus said, learn of me. You see, Jesus was the professor at this university and he spoke as one having authority. And today I want us to sit at the feet of Jesus as a professor. Now there are three required courses in this university of life. Three required courses. You have to take them. There's nothing you can do about it. First, you've been born. Life itself. Now, you didn't choose to be born. 
One man said to his son, Son, if you had asked to be born, the answer would have been no. We were not consulted about living. Nothing we can do to stop living. You did not choose where you were going to be born, and you didn't choose what color skin you were going to have. That's the reason you shouldn't ever have racial prejudice. That person who may have white skin or that person who may have dark skin or a brown skin, they didn't ask. They didn't have a choice. Love them as fellow human beings and certainly love them as fellow Christians or believers if they are. So you cannot escape. You can't jump out of your skin. You can't jump out of your race. You can't jump out of life. You're here. So that's one fact that you can't change. Now, the second required course is that you're going to die. You're born, you live, but you're going to die sometime. God said to Hezekiah, thou shalt die and not live. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. Ecclesiastes says there's a time to be born and a time to die. It doesn't matter whether it's five years or ten years or fifty years from now, you're going to die. Many biblical characters and many people in history who lived many years, but they all died. There's a day, there's an hour, there's a minute already appointed, already set for your death. The Bible says, seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds and he cannot pass. There's only one man in history who did not have to die, and that was Jesus Christ. But he chose to die, to die for you in your place on the cross. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself, he said. He didn't have to die. He did it voluntarily because he loves you, and he loves you, and he loves you. And it's a wonderful thing to know that he's willing to help us carry the burdens of life and that he loves us and he's willing to forgive our sins and our failures and our mistakes. And we can start life all over again. We can be born anew, born afresh, born again. Think of it. He not only died on the cross and they buried him, but he was raised from the dead and he's coming back. He said... There's more. The best is yet to be. For to this end, Christ both died and rose, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If this is the end, if this life is all there is, we're miserable. What's life all about if this is it? We live a short time and we die? then it's all over? Don't tell me that. There's a meaning to life. There's a purpose to life, and it's outlined in the Bible. Outlines exactly what it's going to be and tells you exactly how to do it. Death is never the last word in the life of a good person. There's life after death. Paul wrote to the Romans that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Thou shalt be saved. You shall be saved. If you're willing to acknowledge Christ as Lord and Savior and you believe in your heart and commit yourself to a risen Christ, you can be saved tonight and you can know it. And then the third thing in this university that's required, and that is the judgment of God is required. Someday you will have to give a moral account of the life that you lived here. You see, from the moment that you were conceived, God has been watching you and recording in something called the books. Every thought that you ever think, every motive that you have, every decision that you make, Every word that you say, all the hidden things are there to be shown on the screen someday at the judgment and to be listened to. And you will be judged according 
to what is there unless you have come to the cross and repented of your sins and received Christ as Savior, then the tapes are erased. The pictures are wiped out and even God cannot recall them. It says God forgets our sins. He buries them in the depths of the sea. When you're born, your name is written in the books and everything you've ever done or thought or said are written in the books. When you receive Christ, really receive him, I don't mean just joining a church, I mean really receiving him, committing your life totally and completely to him. When you do that, he wipes your name out of the books, blots it out, and writes your name in the book of life. And if your name is in the book of life, you're going to go to heaven. And you're going to have heaven here on earth from that moment on there. Oh, there'll be problems and sorrows and difficulties and all, but he'll be with you through them. And even when you come to die, he'll be there to hold your hand in that moment that you must face. Now, there are certain courses at the university that you can choose. The options in the university of life. First, you can choose your way of life. Joshua said, choose you this day. You have the right to choose. That's what makes us different from the animals, or at least partially different from the animals. We have the right of moral choice. You can choose. God doesn't coerce anybody into his kingdom. He doesn't make you obey him. You can choose. You can reject him if you want to. You can shake your fist at him if you want to. Or you can open your heart and let him in because the Bible teaches that he's knocking at your heart's door wanting to come in. The Bible teaches there are two roads of life. Either through the narrow gate for wide is, or enter through the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many there be that go therein. But small is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life and few there be that find it. He said only a few of the people that have been born in the history of the world are going to find that narrow gate. They may find it, but they refuse to go in or they neglect to go in. The narrow gate is the cross. You have to come by the way of the cross. Oh, we like to have a cross around our neck. We like to have it embossed on our Bibles. We like to see beautiful gold crosses. We like to see the cross on the top of the steeples in the churches. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that old rugged cross where Christ died and shed his blood for you. You come to that cross and say, Lord, I am a sinner and I'm sorry and I'm willing to turn from my sins and I receive you from this moment on and I make total commitment to you without reservation. That's when your name is blotted out of the books and that's when you're walking on the narrow road. That's when you go through the narrow gate that leads to eternal life. Jeremiah said, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. There are two ways set forth in the Bible. The way of life, the way of death. Which way are you on? Which road are you on? I'm asking you tonight to change roads because you're on the way of death. You're on the broad road that leads to destruction. Turn, change. You can. That's what this meeting is all about. That's why these men have worked and prayed and these women and young people to bring this all about so that people like you will change roads before it's too late. You see, Satan used a beautiful serpent to come and deceive Adam and Eve. And he tempts in three ways, and he's tempting in those same three ways tonight to you. Appetite, beauty, pride. In Genesis 3, 6, she saw the forbidden fruit that it was good for food, appetite. Secondly, pleasant to the eyes, beauty. Make one wise, pride. Satan did not disguise himself when he tempted Christ in the same three ways. Jesus resisted him. And you know how Jesus resisted the devil when he came in the same three ways that he did to Eve? By quoting scripture. 
He didn't argue with the devil. He just quoted scripture. He said, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now, he tempts you in the same three ways. There's first the lust of the eye. That's the appetite for things. Possessions can become the supreme object of your life. These things are not wrong, but when your life is centered in the acquisition of money and possessions, that's wrong. That becomes idol worship, and God hates idol worship more than any other sin. That's the lust of the eye. Then there's the lust of the flesh, pleasure. It looks beautiful. There's lust, physical things, luxury, entertainment, taking first place over God. And some of us are selling our souls for pleasure, overeating, wrong use of sex, too much alcohol. The scripture says, the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God shall abide forever. That's what we heard a moment ago. It passes away. All of this that you see and hear and are doing will be gone in a short time. The only thing that'll last is what you've been doing for God and your faith in Him. Then there's the pride of life. That's position, the ego, with all of its self-centeredness. Not only are these things wrong in God's eyes, but they do not give permanent satisfaction. And then the second thing that you have a right to choose, you can choose whose master, who's going to be your master. The question put to Pilate was, what shall I do with Jesus? That was his question. What shall I do with Jesus? That's the most important question in the world. What are you going to do with Jesus? You cannot escape Jesus Christ in our generation. He's everywhere. All over the world, he's knocking at people's doors, asking to come in, not pushing the door open, just asking for you to turn the handle and say, come in, Lord Jesus, and take charge of my life. I'm making a mess of it. The disciples asked him in an earlier chapter, whom do men say that I am? He is the Lord and the Master the Son of God. And then thirdly, you can choose your destination. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Narrow is the gate and hard is the way which leadeth unto life. But you choose which road you're going to be on. That's your choice. That's your option. What are you going to do about it? You can make your commitment tonight to Christ and say yes to him. I've met three people already today that said that they made a commitment to Jesus Christ in one of our crusades somewhere. Well, three tonight. About four or five today in all. And they wouldn't turn back for anything. The joy and the peace and the sense of forgiveness and fulfillment that they found in Christ and the scripture says, come while you're young. Don't wait till you get older. Because you see, the older you get, the harder your heart becomes. And there'll come a time when the Spirit of God will speak to you, but your heart is too hard to hear. You've put it off too long. Come while you can. And many of you older people or senior citizens that may be here tonight, if God has even whispered to you, you come. This may be your last moment when you'll be so close to the kingdom of God. You open your heart and let Christ in. You say, what do I have to do? First, repent of your sins. The word repent means to change. Change your mind. Change your way of living. But you can't do that. You have no power to do that. There's some things in your life that you know are wrong that you cannot give up but God will help you if you let him. And then the second thing, you must receive him by faith. Now the word faith means commitment, total commitment. 
I totally commit myself to Christ without reservation. I'm going to trust Him and Him alone for my salvation. And I want to know that I'm ready to meet Him. You may be a member of the church. You may be a Sunday school teacher. You may even be a pastor of a church. But you're not sure about where you stand with God. There was a bishop on the West Coast summer before last that came forward in one of our crusades. And I went to him and I asked him, I said, Sir, I said, why did you come forward tonight? You're the bishop of the church. He said, Mr. Graham, he said, I am a bishop. And I've read the Bible and I've been religious for many years. But I have no assurance in my heart if I died right now, I'd go to heaven. I came forward tonight to be sure. I want to make sure. I'm going to ask you to come tonight and make sure. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. If you've come in a bus, they'll wait. Now, it's not easy to follow Christ. I don't want you to get me wrong. It costs you something. You must deny self, all your selfish ambitions and dreams, and put them in his hands and say, Thy will be done, Lord. And then you must be willing to take up a cross. And that's not easy to take up a cross, a place of execution. Take your stand for Christ in your business or in school or here in Fort Lauderdale where you're visiting or where you live and let all of your neighbors and friends know that you're standing for Christ no matter what. That's taking up the cross because you'll be ridiculed. They may laugh and sneer and not as much as they used to. People are beginning to respect those that stand up for Christ. In our country, at least. I've been to some countries where it's hard to serve Christ. I've been to countries that you wouldn't think of, and they said, you know, we are persecuted for our faith in Christ. But we'd rather have our persecution than all the things you in America have to tempt us and pull us away from Christ. We'd rather have Christ and the suffering than to have a partial Christ or to be a halfway Christian with no suffering. I'm going to ask you to come tonight and say by coming, I want to follow Christ. I want to march with him. I want to follow his flag. I want to serve him. I want him to forgive my sins and give me the certainty that if I died, I'd go to heaven and that my sins are forgiven. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat right now, hundreds of you, and do what we've seen several thousand people do already in the first four nights. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of the platform. And after you've come and stood here for a moment, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. You say, why do you ask people to come forward publicly? Because every person Jesus called in the New Testament, he called publicly. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. There's something about coming forward publicly that settles it and seals it in your life. You come forward tonight and make that commitment. If there's a doubt in your life, you make sure before you leave here because you may never have a chance like this again. He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. We're going to wait on you. If you come from that stand back there, it takes about a minute, a minute and a half. Over here, the same. About a minute, maybe two minutes to come. you see these many hundreds responding to this invitation to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you too can make that same commitment by calling the phone number that's on your screen right now. Counselors are waiting to talk with you, so make that call now. You that are watching by television, you can see that here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, hundreds of people are coming to make that commitment to Jesus Christ. 
you can make the same commitment where you are right now. And if you will, pick up the phone and call that number on the screen. And if you get a busy signal, they'll be there all evening. Keep calling and make that commitment over the phone with these hundreds of people that are coming here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. God bless you. And be sure and go to church next Sunday. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. You're invited on a journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library. Retrace Billy Graham's path from humble farm boy to international ambassador of God's love through multimedia, photos, and memorabilia. But the fruit of the Spirit is love! That is a supernatural. Tour the restored Graham family home place, browse Ruth's attic bookstore, and have a meal at the Graham Brothers Dairy Bar. Enjoy special exhibits, events, and seasonal activities for the whole family. Admission is free, so come walk this journey of discovery at the Billy Graham. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Tonight, I want to speak about a blind man in the Bible that came in contact with Jesus. It's found in the 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel. The 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel. Beginning with verse 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out. And he said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garments, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I may receive my sight. But there are many people today that are just like that. I read the other day that there are 42 million people in the world who are blind. Health authorities estimate that from all causes, half a million children become irreversibly blind around the world each year. And this is a great tragedy, and many people in countries and health agencies are working to turn it around. A tragedy of equal or greater proportion, though, is the spiritual blindness that people have. Because the Bible says you have two sets of eyes. You have physical eyes in which you can see, and you have spiritual eyes. And you can see physically, but you may not be able to see spiritually. And spiritual blindness affects everyone in this audience. There are thousands of people here tonight that you can see me up here, but you are spiritually blind. And it's a blindness that keeps you from really knowing God. Now, Bartimaeus was a blind man and he came out of uh, the little place where he had spent the night and he never had any hope that he'd ever be able to see and he would go outside the gate of Jericho and he would beg from the people that passed by 
people on the way to market or people coming to their business that day and he would say, help the blind, help the blind, help the blind, help the blind. He had his cane, he had an old shaggy coat, he'd begged some bread from a woman as he'd gone on his way and he got some milk and there he sat with other blind people and other beggars and they were begging, hoping that the people would throw them a little bit of money or give them something. And so I look at Bartimaeus and I see myself or I see you. The Bible says he is blind spiritually. And our world leaders are groping. I listen to some of these things on television from some of our world leaders and I'm amazed at the spiritual blindness. And I have talked to some of them privately and, and I, I just, I, I want to reach over and grab them and shake them and tell them that they need Christ because Christ could go open their eyes. And I think only the, the true believers really know what's wrong with the world because what's wrong with the world is a spiritual problem. Now this Bartimaeus could not see his rags, he couldn't see his filth, he couldn't see even beauty. And from time to time we read of someone living in a house or apartment that's filled with empty containers and refuse and garbage. And the person living there may appear to lead a perfectly normal life. And they're well dressed. I know a home like that right now where the lady is well dressed, uh, the husband is, is a doctor, and they are respectable, they're fine people. And when you see them out, you, you think they're the most wonderful couple in the world. But if you ever get into their house, it is a mess. It looks like a hog pen. And that's the way it is with so many of us. We appear all right on the outside, but down in our hearts and in our souls, we know that something is wrong. And for some reason, the person doesn't seem to even care. The scripture says, but the natural man, that's the ordinary man, the man before he comes to Christ, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And it seems foolish for me to stand here and tell you that because Jesus Christ died on a cross 2,000 years ago and rose from the dead, that that can have an impact on your life today and now and give you assurance and peace and joy that you never knew before and help settle many of the problems and relationships that you face and give you a burden for your fellow man. But it's true. And some people would call that foolish. The Bible says that the pro proclamation of the gospel is foolishness to them that perish. You see, you are blinded by the God of this world. Now, who is the God of this world? Jesus called him the devil, the prince and power of the air, the prince of this world. There's another force in the world. And that other force has supernatural power too, and that other force is the devil. And there is a conflict going on, the conflict of the ages between the forces of God and the forces of the devil. You say, why does God allow that? That is a great mystery. It's a mystery as to where the devil came from. Now the Bible tells us in the 28th chapter of Ezekiel. It also tells us in the 14th chapter of, of Isaiah. We get a little picture of it and we get other pictures and glimpses throughout scripture. But there is a devil. Now he's, he doesn't rule in hell. He's never been to hell. He's alive. He settled on this planet. Now you can call evil anything you want to, but we all know that there's evil in the world. And we all know that something is wrong, but we don't know what. Now the Bible tells us that back of it all is the devil. You say, but why doesn't God kill the devil and get it all over with? Well, someday God is going to do just that. He's not going to kill him. He's going to throw him into the lake of fire. But that day hasn't come yet. But the devil has already suffered a great defeat. And there's been a great victory by God at the cross. The cross looked like a defeat for God, but it was actually a defeat for the devil. And you and I can enter into the victory that Christ won at the cross when we come to know him. But till then, the God of this world has blinded our eyes, so our eyes are supernaturally blinded. And that's why only the Holy Spirit can lift those blindfolds that are on your eyes just now. He was not only blind, this man, but he was poor. And we read about the poverty in the world today, and it breaks our hearts. 
Many of us are suffering tonight from spiritual poverty. And then this man was not only blind and poor, but he was helpless. Bartimaeus expected to die in his blindness. No one could heal that kind of blindness. But there was a ray of hope to Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus had heard many rumors of this stranger from Galilee that was going up and down the country healing people and helping people and preaching to people. And he heard the approach of a great crowd of people. His ears were very keen and he could hear them. He heard the children. He heard the people talking among themselves. And he said, what's going on? What's going on? Nobody would tell him and the crowd was getting closer and closer. And he grabbed the skirt of a fellow that was passing by and he said, tell me, who is this passing through town? And this stranger that no one knows his name turned and said, Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. And Bartimaeus thought to himself, Jesus of Nazareth, I've heard about him. I've heard that he can heal people, that he can help people. Maybe he could help me. You know, there only comes a few times in our lives when Jesus of Nazareth passes by and we have an opportunity like we have tonight to receive him. You see, people have been praying and the Holy Spirit has been working and many people have already received Christ. And what an hour and what a moment for you to come. This stranger gave him the message, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. I remember the story of the Surgeon General of Portugal, a former Surgeon General, and he was walking down the street one day and a piece of paper stuck to his foot. He went home, he pulled it off of his shoe and looked at it and it was a gospel tract and he decided to read it and he read it. And to make a long story short, he was converted to Christ and became a great Christian leader and a great Bible teacher. Just a simple little witness like that. God can use all of those things and that's why we ought to always be faithful in our witness because you never know when that waitress in the restaurant or that person that you meet at your work, they'll watch your life, of course, to see if you're backing it up by the way you live. Jesus has been passing by in Hamilton. Jesus has been passing by in the Golden Horseshoe. He may be passing by in your home. He may be passing by in the room that you occupy at a hotel. He's passing by here in southern Ontario. And in desperation, Bartimaeus cried at the top of his voice, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. And the other beggars said, close your mouth, close your mouth. The magistrates will hear about this and they'll come and put us in prison. But he kept on crying out. This was his one moment. This was his one chance. Jesus was there and he was going to take advantage of it. And the other said, keep still, Bartimaeus. Who wants to hear anything from a poor old beggar like you? But the more they rebuked him, the more he cried out. And I want you to notice several things about it. First, he cried for the right thing. He cried for mercy. He needed other things. But the thing that he needed most of all was Christ. He needed God. Have mercy upon me, you son of David. Have mercy upon me. That's what we all need tonight is God's mercy. Mercy. When I stand at the judgment seat of Christ, I'm not going to say, Lord, uh, I want justice. If I get justice, I'm going to end up in hell. I want mercy. And God has offered his mercy from the cross. And he says, I will forgive you and cleanse you from every sin that you've ever committed. You'll never have to face the judgment. You will never be in danger of hell if you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And so you have to say, first of all, I am a sinner. You have to say that to yourself and maybe to others. Just like an alcoholic. Before you can help an alcoholic, you, they have to be willing to say, I'm an alcoholic. Before you can help in drug addiction, you have to say, I am a drug addict. I need help. And when you come to Christ, you must say, I am a sinner. I need help. And oh, Lord God, please help me. And then the second thing, not only did he cry for the right thing, but he cried to the right person. He cried to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, the only one in all the world that could help him, stood right there. And all of his hopes were centered in him. The Bible says none other name is given among men whereby we must be saved except through the name of Jesus. 
To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Jesus had said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And this man, Bartimaeus, was coming in the right way. He was coming to the right person. He was coming to Jesus, the Son of God. And he cried at the right time. Jesus was passing by. Suppose he had waited and said, I'm going to see what the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders have to say about him. I'll wait till he comes to Jericho again. Jesus never came to Jericho again. He may never come in this way again like this. When will we ever see a sight like this in Hamilton again? It's been a long time since this many people came and heard the gospel and so many people worked and prayed and believed as they've done here. And the church is united and cooperated as they've done. And God has been speaking and many people have been finding Christ and tonight you can find Christ. No, he called at that moment. The Bible says, He that hardened his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off and that without remedy. In other words, when you hear the gospel and do nothing about it, it hardens your heart a little bit more. The God, the Holy Spirit, will continue to speak to you, but you can't hear him because you get deaf. The Bible says, He from his joint to his idols, let him alone. There comes a point. I don't know where it is or when it is, but there's a point beyond which you can go. That your heart is so hard that even though God will still speak, you cannot hear. So come now while you have an opportunity. The great governor Felix was trembled when Paul was speaking to him about the gospel. And he said, go your way, Paul. When I have a more convenient season, I'll call for you. But he never had a more convenient season. That was his moment. That was his hour before God, and he didn't take advantage of it. The Bible says, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow. There may never be a tomorrow for you. This may be the moment for you. He that hardened his heck neck, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off. Notice how Jesus met his need. Here was a great crowd of people, and we have a a way today that we think in terms of great crowds. There's a great crowd here tonight, 18,000 people, I'm told. And we think in terms of crowds. We think in terms of filling out churches and filling an auditorium or having a big crowd at a ball game. We think in terms of crowds. But it's interesting, not only did Jesus preach to the crowds, but the greatest sermons I think he ever preached were to individuals. He stopped and stood still when this blind man called him. A great crowd of leaders were around him. He could have said, I don't have time. I'm on my way to Jerusalem to die for the sins of the world. But he stopped on his way to the cross to hear this beggar's cry. He stopped dying on the cross in order to hear that thief say, Remember me when thou comest to thy kingdom. He stopped when a woman touched his garment. And Jesus will stop for you tonight. Because you see, he sees you tonight as though you're the only person in all the world. He doesn't see you as a part of this great crowd. He sees you as you are. He knows all of your thoughts and all of your intents and all the struggles that's going on inside of you. And the Bible says he loves you and he died for you. And if you had been the only one in the whole world, he would have died for you. And Jesus not only stopped, but he said, call him. The scripture says in Luke 19.10, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. You're lost psychologically, spiritually. You're lost. You need somebody to find you and put their arms around you. That's what he'll do for you tonight. And there was a surprise on the face of the people in the crowd to call that poor old blind beggar filthy and dirty. The first time anyone, I suppose, had ever called him. Someone threw his cloak about him. Someone gave him his cane. He threw them both away and came running and fell down before Jesus. And Jesus asked him a strange question. He'd been blind all these years, and Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Can you imagine that? What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord. And that word Lord means that at that moment he had received Christ into his heart. My very own Lord, that I might receive my sight. And I think he was talking not only about his physical eyes, but his spiritual eyes as well. 
Scientists believe that 33 million of the 42 million blind people in the world either can be cured or their blindness could have been prevented. Spiritual blindness cannot be prevented. It's caused by sin and we all have it. But it can be cured by the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll open your eyes and he can open your eyes tonight. What is your need? What do you want Christ to do for you tonight? What do you want me to do, he said. Some of you say, I want him to forgive my sin. I want him to give me assurance and so that I can know that if I died at this moment, I'd go to heaven. I want peace. I'd like to rededicate my life. I've been baptized or I've been confirmed, but somehow I don't have that personal relationship with Christ and I don't have that walk with him that I ought to have and I'd like to have that. And so I'd like to reconfirm my confirmation vows, whatever it is. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. Not money, not good works, but your faith has made you whole. Last December, an 18-year-old student pilot named Kim was making a solo flight cross-country when she became lost in a storm. She couldn't see anything out the windshield of her small plane. She didn't know where she was or how to get out of the storm and back to the safety. Something had gone wrong with one of her instruments. So she reached for her radio and made contact with a local air traffic controller, and she said, I don't know where I am. I need some help, please, please help me. The controller located her on his radar screen and began talking her down toward a nearby airport where the weather was good. She couldn't see a thing, but he could see her on the radar. He knew where she was, which direction she was headed, where she needed to go and the best way to get there. She trusted her life to a man she had never seen whose name she did not know, and he got her out of the storm and safely to ground. Tonight, you can trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've never seen him with your naked eye. You may not know him, but he's there waiting for you with open arms to help you. So I'm asking you to quit flying blind. Trust yourself to Jesus Christ. Follow the guidance of his instruments, which is the word of God, the Bible. And then the scripture says, and immediately, immediately he received his sight. For some people, it's that quick. For other people, it's a period of time in which you're convicted of the Spirit of God and you grow gradually into the knowledge. But there comes a moment when you make that step from death to life, from darkness to light. I'm asking you to take that step tonight. And if you have any doubts about it in your heart, make your commitment tonight. Did you know that each night we've been here, we've seen more than 700 people both nights, each night come to Christ and come and make a commitment? And what I'm going to ask you to do is what we've done all over Latin America, all over Europe, all over the Orient, all over America, all across Canada. We've asked people to get up out of their seat and come and stand in front of the platform and say by coming, Symbolically, I need Christ. I want his mercy. I want his love and his grace. I want to know him for myself. Why do I ask you to come forward and make that a public declaration? Because Jesus hung on the cross publicly for you. He didn't do it in private. He did it publicly. And people were against him, sneering at him. He was naked and bleeding. And he did it publicly. And he said, that if we're not willing to confess him publicly before men, he will not confess us before his Father, which is in heaven. It's a public commitment. And I'm going to ask you to make that commitment tonight. And after you've all come and stand here, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some, a book that you can take home with you to help you in your Christian growth. And if you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait. If you're in a bus, they'll wait. And you people in the other auditorium or the other room that could not get in here, you can get up and come and the ushers will let you in this building so that you can join those that are going to come. And from the balcony, it's taking a little bit longer than I thought the first night. It's going to take at least three minutes for you to come. So get up and start now. But don't let a little bit of time keep you back. And don't let 
the big crowd keep you back. You just get up and come because it's you before God tonight. The most important commitment that you have ever made. And if you want to bring a friend with you, bring your friend. But get up and come and don't let anything keep you back. We're going to wait and people are going to be praying all over this great Colosseum as you come. You'll never have another moment quite like this. You come. We're going to wait right now. And after you've what you see on that screen, there are people that are standing by. And if you get a busy signal, call back a few minutes later. You'll get, you'll get through because there are hundreds of lines. And be sure and go to church next weekend. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classic. Well, this has been a marvelous evening, and I would like to welcome those that have joined by television tonight in various parts of the country and in other parts of the world. Now, tonight, I want you to turn with me to the 19th chapter of Luke. Luke, the 19th chapter, and a very simple little story that many of you have heard since childhood. I'll read it to you. The 19th chapter, the first 10 verses, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was very rich. And uh, this man sought to see Jesus, who he was, but he could not for the press because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be the guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of the goods I give to the poor, and if I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. And that's one of the key verses in all the New Testament, that 10th verse, because it gives you the purpose of the coming of Jesus Christ. He's come to seek and to save that which is lost. But here is this man, Jesus, God-man, walking through Jericho. He's on his way to die on the cross. And as he comes into Jericho, he sees blind Bartimaeus, and he heals him and has that tremendous experience where Bartimaeus was saying, help the blind, help the blind, help the blind. And as Jesus passed by, he cried out, he said, who is this passing by? And somebody stopped and said, Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. And he screamed out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. And if he hadn't cried out at that moment, he would have never been healed. Jesus passed by that one time, just as Jesus is passing by in central Florida right now. And he may never come this way quite like this again when so many people have joined together and prayed and backed this crusade. Most of the churches of central Florida cooperating in this great crusade. When will it ever happen again? Jesus is passing by. And for many of you, this may be the last opportunity that you'll ever have to make certain of your own personal relationship to God. And then, as he was going out of Jericho, Jericho, a relatively small town, there was another man that wanted to see Jesus, and his name was Zacchaeus. And he meets Jesus going out of the town. Now, Zacchaeus was about the most hated man in town. He was the richest man in town. He was a publican, a tax gatherer, rich and despised, a social outcast, because, you see, he was Jewish, but he would collect all the taxes for Rome, the occupying country. And then he would try to get more than the taxes and pay them to Rome and fill his own pockets. That's the way the tax gatherers were in those days. 
They became the richest people in town and the most despised people in town because they were looked on as traitors to their own people. They were looked upon as robbers, as cheaters, and they became very wealthy as a result of it. Now, if Jesus had considered public opinion, he would have looked straight before him when he came to this sycamore tree where Zacchaeus had climbed up in. Now, Zacchaeus was a lonely man. He didn't have any friends. And there are many lonely people here tonight, friends that misunderstand you and loved ones that have betrayed you and you have failed in school. And your loneliness has led you to bitterness. And I imagine he was a bitter man as well because almost every person in town despised him. He was hated and avoided by most people. Yet he had a curiosity. He'd probably heard about Jesus many times. Maybe he'd heard the enemies of Jesus say that he was a devil or he was a fanatic or he was a blasphemer or he was a heretic or he was an imposter. Maybe he'd heard some of Jesus' friends say that he was a great teacher and a good man, the Son of God, the great Messiah that had been predicted or a great prophet. But he wanted to see it for himself. I can see Zacchaeus trying to get through that crowd. He was a very short man. And I imagine some of the people tried to push him away and some would stick their foot out and make him stumble and fall. He was trying to run as fast as he could. Probably if he lived today, he'd have an instamatic camera with him to get a picture of Jesus like my wife does. She has one and uh, I enjoyed married life before she got it. <laughs> and uh, I enjoy it now. She made one of me the other day and, ca and called it me on Golden Pond. <laughs> because I had an old hat and some old specks on and I was sitting there beside a, uh, a fish pond and she took a picture and she's sending it around. Now, it may be on our Christmas card, I don't know. <laughs> and Zacchaeus would have had a tape recorder. And I remember when we went uh, hungry uh, and the first service, we had several thousand people, about 15 or 20,000 people at that first service in the open air outside of Budapest. And when I got through preaching, I heard all these clicks going on. And I turned to my wife. I said, are they gnashing their teeth? And she said, no, those are tape recorders. Everybody's got a tape recorder. And they, they were taking the message down and then they were sending it throughout Eastern Europe, the messages that had been preached. And it was an amazing thing to me in Budapest that you could go to the bookstores and buy my sermons. They put them in book form. And I preached straight gospel sermons just like I'm doing now. God is doing some strange and wonderful and thrilling things throughout the world, mysterious things, things that pass our understanding. The devil is at work, but so is God at work. Now, this man, Zacchaeus, was so anxious to see Jesus that he decided to climb up a tree. He climbed up a sycamore tree. Now, there are many obstacles in getting to Jesus that you face too. He faced the obstacle of being so, so many people there, so small of stature. And I imagine he was sitting up there on that limb with that tape recorder or the camera. He wanted to get everything that Jesus said. He was so interested. You too have your obstacles. Now, if you're watching by television right now, you can pick up a phone and call that number that you see on your screen and get spiritual help right now. There are people standing by to answer that phone. Call right now while I'm talking. But you see, the Bible says, Jesus said, what shall a man profit if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And all the way through the Bible, you find choices made between the things of the world and the things of God. Moses had to make that choice. He had to make the choice between all the wealth of Egypt and all the power of Egypt as an heir to the throne of Egypt. And he had to turn his back on it and follow Christ. Abraham had to turn his back on all he had ever known to go to find a city whose builder and maker was God by faith. And then there are secret sins that become obstacles to coming to Christ. The scripture says, cleanse thou me from secret sins. You see, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. He knows what goes on inside your heart. He knows what you're imagining, what you're thinking, what you're fantasizing. He knows the things you're lusting for. He knows the evil thoughts and the pride and the jealousy and the greed that's in your heart. 
and he judges by what he sees inside, not just what he sees on the outside. And how many of you are members of the church in good standing? Officers in the church, Sunday school teachers, but down deep inside you know that your heart is just as dark as some of the worst sinners in town. And you know you're a hypocrite and you're ashamed of it. You don't know what to do about it. And you wish that somehow you could find peace and you haven't been able to find it. Make your commitment to Christ tonight and say, Lord, forgive me. I want to come back to you. I once knew you. I once knew the joy of Christ. But somehow I've lost that joy and I'd like to find it again. And self-righteousness can also be an obstacle. There is a generation that appear in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. Self-righteous, like the hypocrites of Jesus' day. Now, Zacchaeus was sitting up there. He found his way to the sycamore tree just like you found your way here and curiosity brought him. Curiosity. Did you know many people find Christ out of curiosity? You come to this meeting out of curiosity, many of you. Many of you came because somebody brought you, but many came out of just sheer curiosity. We heard about a man the other night that was on his way past uh, on, the, on the highway, and he saw the lights on. I think it was in, the, in one of the papers, in one of the other papers that I read. And he just stopped in here, and he found a parking place way off somewhere, and he walked over here. And it was halfway through the service. But he gave his life to Christ, and he tells in the paper the joy that he found in Jesus Christ. That can happen to you. And so he calls Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, come down! The crowd murmurs, and they still do, when you eat with sinners or try to reach those who are on the other side of the track. Jesus tears the hide off religious sinners but he treats other sinners with tenderness and love. You see, the argument and the debate that Jesus had was not even with the Roman Empire. His debate was with the religious leaders who were not living as they should live. They were hypocrites. And there are many of us that way. We've developed that same thing. And this is certainly true in some parts of, of our country where people go to church in great numbers, but during the week, they're not living a daily life with Christ. But you know, Jesus never compromised. He doesn't offer a cheap grace or a cheap salvation. When you come to Christ, you must be willing to repent of sin and receive him into your heart. And notice he said it was an urgent call. He said, make haste, come down now. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. There's no promise tomorrow. There's no promise in the Bible that you'll be alive tomorrow. God doesn't make any promises for tomorrow. It's today, now, 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 all the way through the Bible. And it was a successful call because Jesus did go to Zacchaeus' home. Probably took Matthew with him because Matthew had been a publican too and a tax gatherer. And Jesus had said, follow me, and Matthew had gotten up and followed. And maybe he took Matthew with him to give his testimony to Zacchaeus. I don't know. But Zacchaeus probably was very proud that he showed Jesus all the things in his home, all the art that he had, and his servants, and the beautiful carpets he had on the floor, and the beautiful picture windows that he had, and the beautiful view out there, and the grass, and all everything. He was so proud of it all. But Jesus probably just stood there looking at Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus began to wonder, well, why is he looking at me like that? Those piercing eyes, they're reaching into my soul. Then Jesus turned and looked out the window and saw broken humanity. He saw those that were suffering, those that were poor, didn't have anything that Zacchaeus had stolen from and cheated. And Zacchaeus began, his conscience began to bother him. He became convicted of his sins. And suddenly he opened the door and he yelled at the top of his lungs, Lord Jesus, 
I'm ready. If I've stolen from anyone, I'll restore it fourfold. I'll give back everything I've ever taken from anybody. I just want to know you. It took restitution. And it says that he did it with a new joy in his heart. He did it joyfully. There seems to be little joy in too many modern lives, even among professing believers. And the Bible says there are two types of joy. There's joy in heaven when a person comes to Christ. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over oh, one sinner that repents. When you come to Christ tonight, you may be the only one, but you'll set off the orchestras of heaven and the choirs of heaven will be singing because of you. Just one person will cause joy in heaven. Then there's joy inside your heart when you come to Christ. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Notice it was open confession. Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord in front of all the people, Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. That's the reason I ask people to come forward to make their commitment to Christ publicly. Every person that Jesus called in the New Testament, including Zacchaeus, it was public in front of other people. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before my Father, I'll not acknowledge you. If you're not willing to acknowledge me before your friends and other people, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father. Wouldn't it be terrible to get there and Jesus would not even know us? And he says, there are going to be many people that'll say, but Lord, I did this for you, and Lord, I did that, and I did that. But he said, I never knew you. And he won't acknowledge us. Come to Christ openly. Yes, his repentance cost him something. He had to restore fourfold. The surprise of the crowd, the shock of the crowd. There come times for restitution if our repentance and faith are to be real. And the purpose of Jesus coming to the world was to seek and to save people like Zacchaeus who were lost. And many of you tonight are lost from God. And all the prayers and all the work and all the money that's gone into this crusade has gone into it for you, to reach you, because your soul is worth more than all the rest of the world put together. You say, how could that be? Because it's going to be eternal, because it's going to live forever. When you die, that's not the end of you. You can't commit suicide by taking a gun to your brain. Your body dies, but your spirit, the real you, lives on forever and ever and ever and ever, in heaven or hell. And it depends on what you do with Christ now. Publicly, I'm going to ask you to receive him tonight. You know, there was a little boy that was lost in the mountains of North Carolina where we live. And they organized the police and they organized the helicopters and they got all the police dogs they could and they organized hundreds of people to search for that little boy. And they searched for about five days before they found him. And when they found him, he was already dead, piled in the snow and lost. It was too late. Thousands of people have worked and prayed for this crusade, for you. And God sees you sitting there. And he knows your heart and he knows your need and he calls you by name and he says, make haste, Mary, come. Jim, make haste, come. For today I'm coming into your heart. Will you allow me? Will you entertain me into your life and into your heart? You say, well, Billy, what, what really do I have to do? First, you have to be willing to repent of your sin. You say, well, what does that mean? That means to change your way of living, to change your thinking about Christ and about God and about yourself. It means to live a new kind of a life. It means that you're willing to give up some of those wrong things in your life and walk with him. That's repentance. And Jesus said, except a man repent, he can't see the kingdom of God. Have you repented? Are you sure of it? Did that change take place? I'm not talking about, did you say, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. That's not repentance. Oh, Lord, I've sinned. That's not repentance. It means a change. 
Old things have passed away and everything becomes new. And then the second thing, you must receive him by faith, but as many as received him to them give you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Just simple faith. Like a little child believes in its father, its mother. You believe. Jesus said you have to become like a child. You may be the professor at the university in mathematics or some of the sciences, but you have to become like a little child when you come to Christ. In faith, believing. Just as I have confidence and faith in this platform to hold me, that's what the word faith means. You put your confidence in. You put your strength in. You put your everything you have in Jesus Christ. And you're going to do that tonight. And then the third thing, you must be willing to follow him and obey him in reading the scriptures and in prayer and in witnessing. Are you ready to do that? If there's a doubt in your heart tonight that you are right with God, you come and be sure. You may not be a member of any church or you may be a member of several churches. I don't know. You might have been baptized every way you can be baptized, but that's not enough. You must come to Christ and find him as your Lord and your master and your savior. And I'm going to ask you to do it right now. We have seen hundreds of people every night come. I'm going to ask you tonight to get up out of your seat and come. And you that are watching by telephone or watching by television, pick up that telephone and call and there'll be a counselor to talk to you right now. And you can make the same commitment the people are going to make here. And I'm going to ask hundreds of you to get up out of your seat and come because you may never have another moment like this again. Come now. If you come from that top balcony up there, it takes about two minutes. So start now. If you're with friends or relatives or you've come in a bus or with a group, they'll wait on you. After you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. You get up and come. You know you need Christ. Bring your friend with you. Husbands and wives and sweethearts and whole groups that are here tonight, you need to come. You get up and come. We're going to wait. Young and old, there's some old people here tonight. You've heard the gospel many times, but somehow you've never really found peace with God. And you're uncertain about your relationship with him. Come and settle it tonight. We're going to wait as many people come from everywhere. Counselors are standing by waiting to talk with you. If the lines are busy, just wait a moment and call back later. Or write the number down so that you can call at any time throughout this evening. Counselors will be there as long as the calls keep coming in. God bless you. You that have been watching by television, you can see here in Orlando, Florida, in this beautiful tangerine bowl, you can see many people coming to make their commitment to Christ. You can make that commitment right now where you are. You may be in a bar room, you may be in a hotel room, you may be in your living room or in your bedroom. Right where you are, bow your head and say, yes, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. And he'll bring you the same joy and peace that he's brought to my heart of those you've heard speak tonight or sing tonight. Give your heart to him now. And if you will, pick up the telephone and call. You may have to call two or three times. Keep calling. There'll be people there for the next two or three hours ready to talk with you. Don't let this night pass or this day pass without making that commitment. God bless you and be sure to go to church next Sunday.
you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. Just music with its own story. Grandma's old tales, hearts kept listening. Every flash illuminate her face. Crackling logs, boots still glistening. In this cabin, time moves at its own pace. Fear darkness, never felt lonely. Storms, just music with its own story. Thunders calling, winds a howling, rain taps a rhythm on the tin. Candles flicker, shadows linger, warmth inside where tales begin. Never fear darkness, never felt lonely. Storms just music with its own story. Old oaks creaking branches. 